Do you ever wonder what it takes to train powerful computer vision models? So here's an unpopular opinion. The data is more important than the model. So in computer vision, you're likely using a model that is consuming a lot of data during training to perform a task like segmentation, object detection, binocular depth estimation, or whatnot. And the data that the model consumes during training is going to determine what drives predictions in the production end of things. So in order to understand, so working backwards, in order to understand in production how your model is performing, you have to know what data went into it. You have to be able to explain it. So this, this kind of motivates why understanding a data set, even if it's a benchmark data set, is so important. And in a case of transfer learning, where you use a simple, well-curated benchmark data set like Cityscapes, um, in this case I have an, NY, an example of the NYU depth data set. Um, this is a pretty, pretty nice data set, but if you're going to do something like pre-train on this and then transfer learn on your target data set, it's very important to understand the what data went into the training at every portion of the training pipeline. So ultimately in this video, we're just gonna dive into this data set and understand it and get a first glimpse at what it takes to go into an already curated data set and understand and get some ideas of what could drive predictions if we were to train models with this data set. So let's go, let's go ahead and get started. So I have the NYU data set pulled up. Um, here's a paper, I'll link this. It's linked to the notebook. You can download it from their website. So I'm going to be working with RGB depth and segmentation masks. So we'll go back to here. I have a data loader already brought up, and I'm not even going to do any transformations. I'm just going to put it into a PyTorch tensor. So let's go into what the data, what the PyTorch data loader does. So this data set has over 800 labels. And we might not want to use all of these labels. It is not not effective to basically not a, not going to be very effective to have this many labels for a deep learning model since the data set has less than 1,500 samples altogether that we still need to split to train a validation and test sets. Um, so here's the normal thing: we have transforms, a normalization, and then a depth normalization. So we have basic stuff right here. We need to rotate these by default since the data sets in an H5 file and we can grab images, depths, and labels and then names of the categories or classes and we essentially just just um, do our apply our transformations and return the image which is our tar which is our input and then our target depth and our target um, segmentation mask or in this case label because I'm going by the same notation that the authors of the data set set and their h5 file or their dot map file that we're reading as an h5 so you can, you can look through this code it's pretty self-explanatory um, we do one other thing we condense and all 800 labels into a top k labels which could be 50 10 20 we'll go over this part later but let's first kind of explore what's going on without the top k labels so we're going to load the data set i have it stored locally and once again you can go to the website and download it. I believe you need to make an account and log in. It takes about two minutes to do. So we're going to take a random index that I picked manually just for this example, and we're going to pull up a picture. So see, we have um, a scene of some cups, and we have depth, and we have our semantic labels, where label zero is corresponds to unlabeled. So it's not. Um, there's going to be cases where we have this this black areas right here, and this means there was just no label applied. So since we don't have a split for this, since we're kind of just using the small amount, we're just going to use um, PyTorch's random split. We're going to do a 70, 70 30 for train and validation, and then I'm going to even split this um, 30 percent even further to a validation and test set. So. I'm not going to actually use this in, vi in the video. We're actually just going to only go over the training data set. So what I'm doing right here is I'm just gathering every single label in the data set to see how many counts 
of each one. So there, and I'm also taking the minimum and maximum depths. And since I've already ran the cell, it takes a second. Um, I have the you know minimum and maximum depths right here. We see the maximum depth is 9.99, which you know makes me want to set this depth norm to 10. And that's what I've seen in other online toolkits for this data set. And basically the point of this depth norm is to take this depth image and normalize it to some, something small so our neural network can consume it. So the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to use all the labels we have and we're going to get the class counts and create a bar chart of it. And so I've already done this frequently this recently. So we take every label that we have and we do a bin count. So what this is right here is we have is the class counts is the number of times that each class occurs. So this is label zero. This is our unknown. We have some ridiculously large categories right here and some smaller categories right here. And I'm just going to leave these as arbitrary. It's a lot easier to view these on this chart right here. So you can see from zero to over 800, I think there's 821 total. So in this case, the split we made doesn't even have every single category in the training set. And so what this is right here is we have a couple of these that stand out from the, from the crowd and a bunch of other stuff that doesn't, you know, it's almost like it's not even there. And this is going to be terrible for training a deep learning model. And if we're going to actually segment this, our model is going to get confused. We could train other classical computer vision models to segment stuff, but not in the deep learning. So in this case, we'll just pick the top 50 classes and see what we're working with. So right here, we have, you know, wall, we have more wall than unlabeled, floor, cabinet, chair, bed, all the way, you know, all the way down here to some lesser known stuff. And this is just arbitrary. We, we might not even, probably want to maybe even cut it off like a picture right here, maybe do top 10, top 15. But that's not necessarily important. So even though this data, so this kind of takes us down to the bottom line. So even though this data set is quote unquote clean, it's got good depth information, good segmentation labels, it's still not useful for training a deep learning model. We're gonna to need to clean it a little bit. So we could do three things right here. So the hard way, or probably the most interesting way if you ask me is to use some kind of NLP embedding model, do some natural language processing to find similar categories to aggregate them together into a single class. So this could be something like taking, you know, television and monitor and merging that together into a single class and maybe we just label it monitor. Um, the easy way is to do what we just did is just to use the top K classes, top 50 classes, and then throw the rest into the unlabeled category. And even easier, we actually have a 13 class version of the data set already split, already labeled on this GitHub link. And that's another thing. But it's also important to look at how that data was split and how that data was labeled in order to understand it. So we're going to go with option two, just do the easy way, not the easiest right here. So we're going to basically get a list of our top K labels. So we're gonna run this real quick right here. And we have top K labels. So if any class label in our segmentation mask is in here, we know it's good. And if it's not in here, we just move it into the unlabeled category of zero. So how do we do that? We just go, th go through each label and Okay, let's print this out. Okay. So here are the labels that we have in our, in our segmentation mask. We have four, zero, four, 11, 21. And then we have these other three labels that are not common classes. So in this case, so 35 is false. So if it's not in our top K labels, we basically set this value to zero in the segmentation mask. So we can go come in here and we can see that now we only have four categories in our segmentation mask and we have essentially reduced the data and cleaned it up a little bit. So let's go see how we implement this in the data loader. So this top K labels is a list right here. 
note that it's a li some kind of array or a list. So when, every time we get an item, we load everything from the H5. And then if we have this list passed to the data set, we essentially take every label, every unique label, and if it's not in the top K labels, we set it equal to zero. So we do this outside of the data set. It's a little bit involved. And the reason we could do it inside, the reason I chose to do it outside, it takes a little bit of, I want to work with the training data. I don't want to do any data snooping in order to get this top K labels. And honestly, I think it wouldn't matter too much, but I do believe it's a good habit to only work with a set portion of your data set, which is the training portion. And typically I set that portion to work with and I leave the validation and, and test set alone as much as possible. So that, that's why I sort of like to do that outside of the data set so I can actually take the split into consideration. So if we load this back up, look at the same picture. We have the original segmentation mask and the new segmentation mask without the shelves and without all the cups on the shelf. So we can kind of get a better view here of what we can segment, what we can't. And we can see here we have a lot of stuff chopped out of this new one. Now, how can this be useful? Or how can this be useful in knowing what's driving predictions? Well, let's look at the case for a robot that navigates through an indoor environment. So go up here, say the robot, all it needs to know is where it can navigate and where it can't navigate. So the robot can use the depth information to understand if there's an obstacle in the way and it knows it cannot navigate through there. And the robot can use a, de a segmentation information to understand where it can navigate. So for example, we can segment the floor right here and we can segment the wall and we have depth information to cover this other stuff right here. Even though we don't know the category of it, we know that there's an object there that it can't navigate there. And we can feed this depth and the simple segmentation. I mean, also we might only need floor and wall into a path planning algorithm or any kind of path planning framework and help our robot navigate through this environment. And in this case, we're simplifying what could be driving a prediction by only using a small amount of segmentation classes. So I hope that kind of clears things up. This is just an introduction into diving into the data. You can dive into the data, honestly, for days, get lost. I wouldn't recommend it, but I do recommend going into your data set, understanding you know, different kinds of labels that are in it, what's in it, how it was made, read the papers, and kind of hopefully you can use this to um, get started in the NYU data set. So that's all for this one. I'll see you in the next one.